I've spent the last couple of months out here in the garage and on the golf course developing my very own version of the single plane golf swing. After checking out some of the yardages that I'm producing with my irons and my driver, the driver was a bit of a disappointment. And that got me to thinking, is it possible to increase my distance with the single plane swing without giving up the accuracy that it provides? Welcome to Turbo Mo. Hey everybody and welcome back to Golf Test Dummy, the channel where I use my game to help your game. And like I said in today's video, I'm talking about trying to turbocharge the single plane golf swing. Now I know this is going to be a little bit controversial. There's some people out there who are pure traditionalists and they would believe that anything that chases distance, that goes after more distance, flies in the face of what the single plane golf swing is all about. But let's be honest, the channel's called Golf Test Dummy, and if I'm not testing stuff, then... Now before you click off of the video and you take this idea and you crumple it up like a piece of paper and toss it in the trash can, hear me out, I've got a couple of pieces of evidence here that sets precedent to show that this is nothing new for the single plane swing. Now there's gonna be a comment, or 12, that somebody's gonna bring up the fact that Mo in some of his videos said that he never thought about distance ever. He never considered it. He did not chase it. But even into his 60s, I believe Mo Norman had a driver head club speed of about 112 to 117 miles an hour. Also, even with antiquated equipment, Mo was still hitting the driver at 265, and I believe that was with a persimmon, a persimmon club. So Mo didn't really have to worry about distance because he already had it. Then of course there's Todd Graves, the, the main teacher that everybody knows that's associated with the single plane swing. He worked with Mo Norman for years to develop his own technique. He even has a DVD out called Maximizing Speed and Distance. So he's considering trying to get as much distance out of the single plane swing as possible as well. Everybody has heard of Bryson DeChambeau, absolute monster stock yardages coming out of this guy. I mean, he's just pumping the golf balls out there. Insane rocket ships flying off of his club face. Now he has added a lot of weight in the form of muscle, and he's also done a lot of speed training, but he is still a single plane swinger. It is his version of the single plane swing. It has made an evolution over time since he was younger and started out with it and now to present day. And if you think that Bryson DeChambeau is not concerned with accuracy and consistency, he is known as the golfing scientist and whether you like him or not you have to respect what this guy's doing with distances and yardages and what he's done for the single plane golf swing to bring it to the forefront of everybody's attention and one last little nugget mo norman even said that ben hogan and he had this little secret in order to sort of turbocharge his drives and pump them out there another 30 yards further so even though he says he wasn't concerned about distance he had to be concerned with it just a little bit now the theory behind this and the premise is as follows. I'm not saying that I just want to go for raw distance and I want to try and figure out how to just send the golf ball out there as far as possible. No, I've got to find that balance. I want to keep the basic premise of the single plane swing. I want to try and keep some of the fundamentals and some of the components that I have in place with my swing as it is now because I am getting a lot more consistency and accuracy and I'm not willing to give that up. But I want to see how far I can push the yardage before accuracy and consistency really start to fall apart. This is mainly for my driver because my driver, the gapping, and from my last video you can go back and see it, the gapping, it's just not there. The driver distance that you should expect after looking at my iron distances, it just doesn't match up. If you're leaving distance on the table with your driver and you know you could get another 10, 20, 30, 40 yards, why would you leave that distance out there and not bring it into your bag? But here are some things that I do not want to do with this experiment. I don't want my effort levels to go up. I don't want to feel like I'm swinging out of my shoes. I don't want to feel like I'm swinging too hard. I do not want to add more effort and more hitting hard at the golf ball. Another thing that I don't want to do, I do not want to have to hit the gym or do push-ups every night and sit-ups and lift insane amounts of weight to try and bulk up and get like Bryson DeChambeau and add on all this muscle. I don't want to do that. don't want to take on some kind of special diet where I'm drinking 37 protein shakes a day and eating kale sandwiches. don't want to go through all of that because a lot of you out there are not going to want to go through that either. I know that the Garmin R10 approach does not actually measure spin rates, so that is going to be a little bit of a handicap for me out here. 
I'm not going to be able to get actual spin rates because this just calculates spin. It doesn't measure it. But I hope that the software and the device itself is intuitive enough to where if it sees my ball coming out at a different speed or a different angle with a different you know sort of angle of attack and a different launch angle that maybe it will also change its spin numbers to coordinate with that and hopefully that will add up to be an optimized ball flight. I've got my custom Air Jordan painted M2 driver with a stiff Pro Force V2 UST shaft it will do 15 shots to get a baseline we'll see what my club head speed is we'll see what my ball speed is we'll see what the garmin r10 kicks out for spin if it's high or low uh, and we'll also see what the carry distance and the rollout distance is as well as flight patterns I've got the data pulled up on the iPad here. I had 15 total shots. Some of these spin rates, just looking at them, I haven't gone back and looked at the, uh, the, the averages yet, but I saw some that were up over 4,500, I believe, RPM. Whew. If that is pretty close to accurate, that is a whole lot of backspin. <laughs> of course, with the Garmin R10, we had to take the spin with the grain of salt. So, if I were to get on a TrackMan or a GC Quad, of course they may do excellent. I might get, you know, a lot lower spin numbers or I don't know, maybe I'm up at 8,000 RPM actually with the driver. Something I don't hear people talk about too often. If you're swinging at 110, 115 miles an hour, or even at 105, 107, you need that high launch, low spin golf ball because the back spin is gonna make the ball balloon up in the air with that much speed man, it's just gonna make the ball climb into the air and come down like a parachute. It's not gonna roll anywhere. You're gonna lose distance. But if you're swinging in the average swing speed range, which is like 90 to 95 is, is I think the average for most people, you need backspin. <laughs> if you were to hit a, a driver that was a nine or a 10 degree driver and your swing speed was like 85 miles an hour and you didn't have at least some sort of backspin on that golf ball, it would fall back down to earth so fast your head would spin. It would come out with low spin and it would want to roll, but it would never have any carry on the golf ball. You would be losing distance because you don't have enough spin. So if you're swinging at 90 miles an hour, you might need about 25, 2600 RPM because the backspin will keep the ball in the air a little bit longer and give you more carry to be able to bomb it out there. But if you're, if you're hitting the ball like Alex Etches at 120, 125 mile an hour, yeah, you need low spin. You need that sucker to be at like 16, 1700 RPM. You need a seven degree driver and you need to be hitting up on it to where you're just sending it into the stratosphere. Most of us are not blessed with that kind of speed and that kind of talent. In looking at all these numbers, I was probably 91 to 92 uh, mile an hour on average. So that's gonna be my baseline going into the next videos. And what we're gonna try to do is this. We are going to try and use some of Bryson DeChambeau's speed drills. Alex Etches actually did a video on this. I saw him do it where he attempted this, but Bryson in a copy of golf.com gave an interview and gave a formula on how to increase your club head speed. It was a, a series of, of steps that you needed to take. I believe there were six steps. We're gonna do that in the next video, and we're gonna keep doing that for a while. You don't wanna do it every day, 
but we're gonna see if I can ramp up my speed. You will have to put more effort in in the drill for sure. You're gonna be swinging your guts out, but then the theory is is that once you come back and you make a normal swing, you should have more zip. You should have a few more miles an hour or more on your club head speed, which should translate to more ball speed, which should translate to more distance. Guys, thanks for watching the video. Stick around, hit subscribe if you haven't already because when the next video comes out, I'll be going through the Bryson speed changing drills. We'll see if I can get past step one. I believe it's gonna be really challenging. It's gonna be very tough, uh, but we'll see if I can get through that. And then we're gonna track this over the next couple of weeks and see what kind of headway I can make. Let's see if I can get this optimized to where I get more distance out of my driver, but I don't give up this beautiful accuracy and consistency